Good afternoon. We're going to now start this committee on civil rights. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Darlene Mealy. I am the chair of the New York City Council Committee on Civil Rights. I'd like to introduce my other colleague that is on this committee. And, uh, oh, God, I. Our uh, committee, um, Danny Drum, today Committee on Civil Rights will hold an oversight hearing examining the rise in discriminatory harassment claims by the Commission on Human Rights. According to the NYPD, by March of this year, hate crimes in New York City had increased by 55 percent compared to the same time in 2016. Some of the hateful and biased incidents the city has seen this year have involved property destruction, such as SWAT stickers, graffiti on the inside of subway cars. Other incidents were more physically violent in nature. Individuals can and should always report hate crimes to the NYPD. However, not all hateful and biased incidents are covered under our state hate crime status. For those incidents that may not rise to the level of a hate crime, individuals can also seek recourse through the city human rights laws. By submitting a complaint claiming discriminatory harassment to the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Today, the committee will hear testimony from the Human Rights Commission and various advocates about the discrim discriminatory harassment provision under the New York City Human Rights Law. We hope to learn more about this remedy and to discuss how to work together to help New Yorkers address and seek relief from hateful and biased incidents. Thank you to Civil Rights Committee staff and their hard work, Z. Emanuel, Hey Lou, Council to the Committee, in Child Chaudhry Legislative Council, and Rachel Cordora, Deputy Director of Government Affairs Division. We will now hear from our first panel, the administration. But before we do that, we will administer the oath. And this, can you raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth? the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee and to respond honestly to the city council questions. Thank you so much. You may begin. You, and you can say it in, in the mic. Okay. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Thank you. Hi, I'm, um, I'm Lauren Alfont, Chief of Staff at the Commission on Human Rights. Um, and this is Zoe Chenitz. Uh, who is senior, who's policy counsel at the commission as well. Um, good afternoon, Chair Mealy and members of the Civil Rights Committee, and thank you for convening today's hearing on the commission's work on discriminatory harassment. My name is Lauren Alfont, and I am chief of staff at the commission. As we have all seen and heard over the past year, bias, motivated harassment, discrimination, and violence is on the rise, fueled by divisive, xenophobic rhetoric and policies from our country's top leadership. Alongside our sister agencies and elected officials um, committed to supporting communities targeted by this hateful conduct, the Commission has increased its outreach efforts, strengthened engagement and collaboration with community partners and faith leaders, and promoted unequivocal messages of support. As a result of these efforts and our on-the-ground partnerships, reporting to our agency is up dramatically. While reports of discrimination were up 60 percent from 2000 to 2015 to 2016, this year we are on, on pace to exceed those numbers. As Commissioner and Chair Carmelin P. Malalis described in her budget hearing testimony, the Commission has completely revamped and revitalized every area of its operations in the last two and a half years, thanks to support from City Council, uh, the administration, the public advocate, and our community partners. Under Commissioner Malalis's leadership, the Commission is well positioned to implement creative and innovative strategies to root out discrimination and support impacted communities. In response to the pre- and post-election climate, the, com the Commission focused its efforts on ensuring that vulnerable and targeted communities understood that they had a resource, an ear, and a partner at the Commission. 
and that the Commission is a viable venue for justice and for those facing discrimination, harassment, and bias-motivated violence. We held listening sessions with community leaders on a variety of themes, including racial justice, LGBTQ rights, <laughs> immigrant rights, workers' rights, and also with faith leaders. The concerns raised during those roundtable discussions directly impacted the work the Commission undertook in the wake of the election, which includes a significant focus on discriminatory harassment and which I will describe in detail. The protections against discriminatory harassment are a unique provision of the New York City Human Rights Law. Unlike other areas of employment, housing, or public accommodations, claims under this protection, under this provision, do not require that a specific relationship exist, such as worker-employer, tenant-landlord, customer-business, be established. The provision instead creates a cause of action for any individual who is knowingly targeted with violence or threatened with the use of physical force because of the individual's protected status, resulting in intimidation, injury, or an interference with the legal rights of the victim. Discriminatory harassment also occurs when someone damages or destroys another individual's property because of their protected status. As you may be aware, the provision on discriminatory harassment was added to the city human rights law in 1991 and amended in 1993 in an effort to increase, to address an increase in bias motivated violence and harassment and provide victims with the option of bringing civil claims in addition to reporting to the police to assert their rights and obtain remedies. The incidents cited in the legislative history are remarkably similar to the kinds of attacks and harassment we have seen since the election. For example, assaults and acts of vandalism targeting victims because of their religion, ethnicity, race, sexual orientation, or other protected status. However, we are not aware of any case law, either administrative cases litigated through oath or cases filed in New York State Court that specifically address claims under this provision. So in many ways, the work that the Commission is doing now to promote this very unique protection is unprecedented and groundbreaking. In response to the new socio-political climate, the Commission <coughs> assembled a bias response team within our Community Relations Bureau. The team, in addition to their existing responsibilities, monitors discrimination and harassment across the city and responds to bias incidents. The team receives reports and information of bias incidents from the public, advocates, and city agencies, and through reports from news media and social media. Bias response team members are stationed in every borough. When a bias uh, response team member learns of a bias-related incident, they reach out to the victims to address the incident. They reach out to the impacted community, the individuals, the religious institution. They gather information. They provide resources and know your rights information to affected communities so they know how to report discrimination and file a claim if they want. The Commission is expanding this work and is in the process of hiring two bias response investigators who will serve as human rights specialists and will coordinate the Commission's work in this area across the city. These positions are posted, and we are in the process of interviewing applicants right now. In addition, the, the Commission has recently added two key roles to this community outreach team. A lead advisor on Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities, recently filled by Widad Hassan, formerly of Muslim Community Network, and formerly held by Rama Issa, now Executive Director of the Arab American Association of New York, and a liaison to Jewish communities, recently fi uh, filled by Beth Miller, formerly of the U.S. Advocacy Office at Defense for Children International Palestine, to ensure these diverse communities are supported and served at the Commission. I've highlighted some recent examples of how the bias uh, response team has responded to incidents, which I've highlighted in the testimony, but I will not read today. In addition to the bias response team, the Commission has increased its public outreach efforts over the last year to ensure that all New Yorkers understand their rights and protections under our law, focusing specifically on discriminatory harassment and discrimination, harassment and bias based on race, national origin, immigration, status, and religion. <coughs> the Commission held two citywide days of action at transit hubs in all five boroughs in December of 2016 and May of 2017 to inform New Yorkers about legal protections against discriminatory harassment and discrimination on the basis of race, national origin, immigration, status, and religion. We also launched a citywide anti-discrimination ad campaign in May of 2017, affirming New Yorkers' rights to live, work, and pray free from discrimination and harassment. The ads featured six individuals representing black, Jewish, Muslim, Hispanic, Asian, and LGBTQ New Yorkers standing up to scenarios of discrimination and appeared in more than 3,400 placements citywide. 
We also launched anti-discrimination ads on transit apps, such as Transit Tracker New York, My Transit NYC, Quick Stop NYC, New York Trans Next Bus, Transit Tracker MTA, New York City Maps, as well as Google and Facebook, urging people to contact the commission if they witness or experience harassment in the subway, on the bus, at a bus shelter, or at any other public space. We ran multilingual ads in ethnic media in, in New York City, and our Community Relations Bureau launched clinics in partnership with community-based organizations and elected officials in 2017 to reach vulnerable communities across the city to educate them about their rights and speak with them one-on-one -on -one about possible discrimination claims. In early October, the Commission will launch an unprecedented survey of Muslim, Arab, South Asian, Jewish, and Sikh New Yorkers to collect data on their experiences of discrimination, bias, and bias-motivated harassment and violence since July of 2016, when xenophobic rhetoric during the presidential election began to deeply penetrate the national discourse. As a direct result of our series of roundtable discussions in late 2016 and early 2017, and in response to the lack of comprehensive data about the scope and frequency of bias-motivated harassment, discrimination, and violence across at-risk communities throughout the city, particularly because most incidents go unreported, the Commission began to develop its survey project. The Commission partnered with Strength in Numbers Consulting Group, an MWBE research and evaluation firm experienced in conducting rigorous community-based survey projects in partnership with marginalized communities to consult with partner organizations on the development of a survey. In partnership, in partnership excuse me, with this organization and 20 advocacy organizations, direct service providers and community-based organizations serving these communities in this city, the Commission convened 15 groups with 118 community members who live in New York City about their recent experiences with and perceptions of bias, harassment, discrimination, and hate crimes. The findings of these focus groups served as the basis for the development of a five to 10 minute survey available electronically or on paper to gather information from these community members on their experiences of bias, harassment, discrimination, and hate crimes since July of 2016. As I mentioned, the survey will launch in early October, remaining in the field until mid-November, and will be available in Urdu, Hindi, Punjabi, Russian, Yiddish, French, Bengali, Arabic, and English. The Commission is working with over two dozen community partners on a comprehensive outreach and promotional strategy for the survey in an effort to yield a diverse and robust sample of the communities in the city. The Commission will publish a final report on survey findings to empower the Commission and other city agencies to better address and combat bias-motivated harassment, discrimination, and violence. The report and survey findings will also serve as an advocacy and fundraising tool for CBOs, advocacy organizations, and direct service providers. We would be happy to partner with members of the committee to bring the survey also to your constituents during the next six weeks. As I have described, the Commission has increased its outreach enforcement and communications work on discriminatory harassment to unprecedented levels, and we will continue to commit significant resources to ensure that New Yorkers know their rights and know what resources are available to them if they face discriminatory harassment or discrimination bias or hate in New York City. Thank you for convening today's hearing, and I look forward to your questions. I want to thank you for that. Um, do you think the presidential election uh, boost up the hate crime statistics or the percentage? I mean, I think there are many organizations that have um, been documenting a rise in hate crimes and discriminatory harassment and just hateful conduct. Um, and so it certainly seems that since the election, we have seen that um, much more blatantly. Um, I don't know the hate crime statistics um, specifically, but I, I do think that there's certainly been a, an increase in reported claims. So um, you don't know the statistics, but we really have in this hearing here now because it's been an upkick in yes. it. And it just happens during this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 2017 election, presidential election. Um, do you think it, any of your claims that you recently received are more severe than the ones that you had before, like with discrimination, not yeah. really violent, but the uptick of um, these cases, have they been more violent? Do you, could you give me a percentage that you say right now between 2017 from 2016, it has violent um, 
discrimination have kicked up? Well, so I, I mean, I, I think interesting, uh, you know, part of what is interesting about the provision of our law, the discriminatory harassment provision of our law, is that although it has been on, on the record since 91, um, there have been very few cases that we don't know of any cases that have gone through oath or, the, or state court or, or any kind of reporting of these kinds of incidents prior to 2015. So in 2016, for example, as compared to 2015, mm -hmm. we uh, saw an increase of 480 uh, percent in reports of discriminatory harassment to this agency. So in 2015, there were 35 reports. In 2016, there were 203 reports. And already, uh, the community, uh, the bias response team has responded since October, since the election, to 82 uh, bias incidents um, since just since October. Just since just last October. October. Since 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 the election, um, and since January, it's been uh, around 61 incidents. That's a real significant increase. Yes. Yeah. Can you um, describe the full process from filing a complaint through? a finding of a discriminatory harassment complaint? Sure, sure. Um, it, you know, it depends on how the case comes in, right? So sometimes people call in anonymously. Sometimes there are complainants who are calling on behalf of themselves or their family member. Um, if the individual wants to file a complaint, uh, they would come, they'd make a call um, to our info line, or, or often they come through our bias response team now since we've implemented this kind of different strategy for handling these kinds of cases. Um, and when someone makes a call, uh, they are uh, interviewed to make sure that they have a, you know, uh, they've stated a, a claim. It's a, an initial review is very superficial. It's a file by right agency just to make sure they're in New York, the incident happened in New York, that jurisdictionally that we should be meeting with them. Um, and so the individual would then come in for an intake with an attorney at our, in our law enforcement bureau. Uh, the law enforcement bureau attorney will meet with them. They will gather more information. They will file a complaint um, uh, and they will begin an investigation. And um, at that point, they're really looking, uh, the commission is really looking at to whether discriminatory harassment or discrimination or whatever the allegations seem to have happened. If there is a determination by that attorney, the investigator, um, based on the information that they have gathered after that complaint is filed, so they request you know, records, they interview witnesses, they go out to the site and talk to people who were involved, who saw what happened. Um, if, there's a, if there's a finding of probable cause, then the case would be referred for the Office of Administration, Administrative Trials and Hearings for a hearing. Um, and the hearing looks much like a hearing would look like in state court. There are some differences, but uh, the commission would present evidence that they believe discriminatory harassment or discrimination occurred um, and would recommend uh, the remedies that they think are appropriate in the case. Um, and the administrative judge will, make a, will issue a report and recommendation uh, that would then be sent to the office of the chair to, to, to issue, uh, to review all of the facts that were presented at the case um, and, and issue a decision and order, which is a finding, which is the judgment then. Within the seven months, have uh, your, your department um, had a claim that you went all the way through and saw a significant... Um, uh, sorry, you finished. Real evidence that it was harassment or discrimination you know, so I think what is also interesting about this provision of our law, so we are openly investigating right now 17 cases. Um, but That's what I want. Yeah, but I think that, um, you know, again, what is interesting and what we learned quite a bit at our listening sessions and through partnerships with a lot of the community-based organizations that we're working with is that we had to think more strategically and kind of creatively about how to respond to bias incidents, right? So we have 85 incidents that we've responded to since October, um, and many of those will not ultimately, you know, end up in a complaint being filed for lots of different reasons. Um, we encourage um, all individuals who've witnessed or experienced discriminatory harassment to report to the commission, but many of those who are reporting are reporting on behalf of somebody else. They don't wish to file a complaint. Um, they were a witness and not the victim. Why do you th feel they're not willing to um, put in a claim? Do you think it's their status? I think that there are lots of different reasons that these particular communities, um, I think historically many of these communities have not had uh, the most trusting relationships to government. I think certainly the tenor at the federal level uh, doesn't help I, you know, in terms of, of that kind of trust. I think though what's interesting is the fact that our complaints, our reporting, excuse me, so has gone me up how so go significantly. Through, yeah, so now we have a third party is putting in the complaint. So how do you um, go about 
if someone else is um, putting in a claim for someone else? You know, I think it really depends. We reach out to that individual. We reach out to the community. Um, we reach out to anybody who's involved. And, and I think our strategy when it comes really to these kinds of cases is to let the community, the impacted community, kind of drive the response, right? So for example, um, if that individual who was impacted by the, by the discrimination decides that they do after kind of talking with us, if they're willing to talk mm -hmm. to us, after we've maybe talked to other people that they trust, right? So maybe we'll talk to their faith leaders and that will make them more uh, willing and, and feel more comfortable yeah. talking to us. So if we do that, it may go in the direction of law enforcement. But I think something that's really interesting about, you know, law enforcement is one tool that we have at our disposal and it's a, a, it's a, it's a valuable tool, obviously, but our Community Relations Bureau also has many other tools at its disposal. So if someone calls in and says, you know, my neighbor, my sister, my brother experienced this, they don't want to file a complaint, but what can you do, right? The Community Relations Bureau can reach out to that commission. Um, I mean, it reach, excuse me, reach out to that community and they can do many different things. So they, they might reach out to community leaders. They might reach out to elected officials in that, in that neighborhood. They might engage in workshops or trainings for, for that community in that neighborhood at the community-based organizations there about people, you know, explaining what people's rights are. They might partner with the CBOs or faith leaders on some initiative. Um, they engage in listening sessions often in response to the bias incidents um, with people who are impacted to hear what they want from us. We do days of action. We do press conferences. We refer cases to LEB when that's appropriate. We, we institute mobile clinics. So we've done a number of mobile clinics where we have lawyers come out from our law enforcement bureau to the communities so that they can partner with a CBO or an elected official to, to, to have people come to us there instead of at our office where people might be more comfortable. Um, sometimes in response to an individual incident, we'll go out and we'll do like a day of action. Like let's say somebody saw something in a subway station or was yelled at by a stranger. <laughs> they don't know who it was. They'll probably never see that person again, but they were on their way into their subway terminal, you know, and they, they were yelled at something ho horrible. You know, we may, our community relations bureau may go out into that, um, to that subway station and do a day of handing out flyers, handing out know your rights materials. We have a lot of published discriminatory harassment materials, know your rights uh, materials, and just kind of be there for the day and, and have a presence so that, you know, maybe that individual who made that comment will, will see us, maybe they won't, but at least the community knows that we're there. Um, we also do literature drops. We do, um, out, you know, bigger kind of, bigger outreach events um, to address kind of specific issues that communities are experiencing. So I think what's interesting is that although our file, you know, we have 17 cases that we are investigating, we also have so many people continuing to call us. And I think it's because we are developing relationships with, with these communities to the extent that they know that when they ask for our help, we'll, we'll, we'll help in whatever way we can. So what are you getting from these uh, sessions that you have with the community, the re religious leaders? Yeah. What is the feedback that you're getting from them? Yeah. Are people really stepping up and putting out um, exactly what they're going through in regards to maybe religious, uh, just someone saying that someone pulled my uh, jeep mm -hmm. um, or certain, certain things like that? Right. What are the religious leaders are saying? I mean, I think in our... Or how they are encouraged their parishioners to come out more, speak out more about it, or put in a claim. Yeah. How far is that going? Yeah. I, you know, I think that what we have heard and what we have learned and what we have seen by the response to us kind of being out in the community is that they need to see us there. They need to see, people in the community need to see us partnering with their faith leaders and community-based organizations because those are who people trust, right? They trust their faith leaders. They trust the people in their community. And if they see us working side by side with all of those people, they are gonna be more comfortable coming to us. Have you ever taken a case right there? Can you do that? Yeah, mm -hmm. we have a mobile clinic. We have uh, uh, attorneys that we send out to sites. So we had something with Satya too recently where we had attorneys from our law enforcement on site and people could come to them and say, this is what I've experienced. Is this a claim and you know, what can you do? And, and we, can, we can start that process right then, um, right then and there. Okay, thank you. I, I wanna leave room for my colleague, Danny Drum which I was going to call him your first name, something else. I'm glad I didn't. Uh, that's okay. Thank you very so much. My friends. It's drum and you can't beat it. Oh, oh, I like that. <laughs> my fourth graders used to say I was the corniest teacher in all schools. <laughs> Never. 
Um, thank you very much, and thank you for your testimony here today. It's always good to hear from the Commission. I'm curious, though, to just learn a little bit more maybe in detail about how you're working with community partners in the South Asian communities, the Muslim communities, the Sikh communities, et cetera. Can you give us a little bit more detail about what you're doing there? Yeah, I mean, I think we are working with a number of faith-based leaders. We have a, um, we, as I mentioned, we have a new lead advisor um, who's here today, um, Widad Hassan, who, oh, sorry, there she is, um, who has, you know, has been with the commission um, for a short time, but comes with a lot of connections and collaborative um, experience already working with those communities. Um, we have, um, and I think our partnership on the survey project is a really good example because we've reached out to lots of different organizations. CARE is one of them. They are here today as well. Um, and, and saying kind of like, what is it that we need to do? How can we respond to what you guys need from us? Um, and, and the survey project was kind of what came out of some of those partnerships and listening sessions. Um, I'm wondering I think if any um, uh, intersection of discriminatory actions, for, for example, South Asian and gay or something like that, are those discussed in the forums or the survey, the groups that you have, the focus groups that you have? Yeah, I mean, it, it is. Uh, we also had a, um, you know, we've hosted events. Uh, we hosted an LGBTQ if iftar mm -hmm. at the center. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we are trying to bring together, I think, you know, that is also, I think, part of what some of our response has, why it has been successful in bringing people together, right, mm -hmm. is because people from lots of different communities, unfortunately, are experiencing this kind of really hateful conduct and, and being targeted. And, and when we have events that bring all of these people together and they look around the room and they see, like, not only are we not alone, but, like, we're not the only ones being targeted and we could work together. And I think it's been a really valuable experience to bring people just into a room. You know, we've, you know, we've seen experience, we've seen, you know, um, I've heard from faith leaders where you know synagogues and and rabbis are going out to support imams at and and masjid, at mosques and masjids and and, and the op and, and vice versa. They're just sitting there outside to say, we're we're here and we support you know these communities and they're they're doing it for each other and it's a really mm -hmm. it's a really amazing thing to watch. It. I would agree with you on that. You know, after Orlando happened um, last year, I held a rally in Jackson Heights in Diversity Plaza. And uh, we had LGBT leaders there as well as over two dozen Muslim leaders. And it was really actually a very unifying thing to yeah. see that happen. Yeah. Really proud of my community for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you know, can you tell us which community groups you are working with? Do you know their names, uh, We're for example? With, um, we're working with CARE. We're working with the Sikh coalition, coalition. We're working with the New York Immigration Coalition. I can get you... Um, a whole, I mean, a list. I can give you a list of all the people we're working with for the survey project, if that would be helpful, because sure. that's 15 organizations, I think. Um, and I can I can get that for you right away after the hearing. Okay, that's great. That would, be, that would be great. Yeah, that's no problem. What's the timeline for receiving the report, uh, for the results? Um, you know what? I, I'm so, I don't know the answer to that, and I can get that for you. We think it will be early uh, 2018. Okay, yeah, from the survey. Early 2018? Mm -hmm. yeah. About four months, three and a half months. Yeah. Okay. All right, good. You know, um, I just wanted to uh, bring up another issue, too. Um, what's the difference between a hate crime and a discriminatory harassment? Yeah. So I think it's, I, I think there's certainly some overlap. I can't, I can't unfortunately really speak to how the NYPD evaluates a hate crime. I think there is, is certainly overlap right between the two um, I think what is important to kind of to know is um, that filing a case with the Commission or coming to the Commission doesn't preclude a criminal investigation mm -hmm. um, there are situations in which we receive complaints or, or in, you know reports of bias conduct and, and we you know we remind people that they can go to the NYPD that's a resource to them as well but I think what's what's really helpful is that you know the experiences that, co that communities are having right now the more tools the better, the more agencies that are kind of available to them, the better. So I think the commission has a kind of unique ability uh, to provide certain resources and tools, in part because of what our commission does, right? Half of our job is law enforcement, but the other half is education, it's outreach, it's, it's you know, promoting inclusion, it's, it's, it's bringing people together. Um, that's actually our job, right? Just as much as our law enforcement. And so I think this is an area where we see that being really valuable. Um, the NYPD, uh, uh, 
Hate Crimes Task Force has, uh, we have been collaborating with them and they have provided us, um, you know, cases where they think we could be extra support to the community, even if someone has decided to file a complaint with the NYPD. They can still file it with us if they choose to, but there's, a, there's so many other ways that we can respond. Um, there's, there's no criminal um, statute for discriminatory harassment, right? Uh, there is there is not, I mean, there's not the equivalent. We call this the kind of equivalent, the mm -hmm. civil equivalent of a hate crime. I mean, it's, it's when people are using force or threat of force to injure people or to intimidate them or to interfere with their rights because of their protected status. If somebody really would be found guilty of that within the commission, they wouldn't necessarily face a prison term. Not with the commission, right. no, no. But if they were to be convicted in a criminal court exactly. uh, on a hate crime, they would they potentially could um, face those. Penalties. So then that leads me to uh, wonder a little bit, um, and in light of what happened in the Bronx uh, yesterday with the killing of that student, um, and um, allegedly the cause of that was bullying, mm -hmm. um, what is the difference between discriminatory harassment and bullying? I mean, I think they can overlap, right? I think bullying doesn't always, um, is not always motivated by someone's protected status, uh, but if it is, it absolutely could could rise to the level of discriminatory harassment under our law. Do you take um, complaints from students? I don't know if we've had any complaints from students. I do know that we're working with schools. We have a uh, bully. We have um, some trainings uh, focused on anti-bullying, um, and I think we are actually really strategizing about how we can directly respond to that. You know, incidents that are happening between young people mm -hmm. um, that that are. Um, related to bullying or this kind of, you know, that's related to people's protection. So uh, according to people that I know that are on the ground at that school, um, there's been no training or um, anti-bullying or GSA support, Gay Student Alliance support for the students in that school. Yeah. And have you ever encountered that school before um, with I any type of complaints? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but uh, certainly, you know, we want to we want to help schools provide the necessary training and support for their students, whether they're experiencing this kind of bullying or whether it's to prevent it from happening going forward. So it's certainly something we will look into. Um, and, and so um, the overlap is there overlap in in terms of um, how many schools do you go into a year? Would you say? I, I don't know the answer to that. I could find out for you. You know, the, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm going this down, down this line of questioning is because so much of the discrimination, particularly discriminatory harassment, yeah. happens by, it's caused by young people, yeah. right? I mean, and, and, and every case that I've seen, or not every case, but many, many cases that I've seen um, of, um, even when it rises to the level of a hate crime, um, it's always the case of, oh, the, 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 the bully or, the, or the, the kid that committed the crime, he's a good kid in the neighborhood, he was raised by a good family, et cetera, so forth and so on. I'm also chair of the Education Committee mm -hmm. and the City Council. And what the, all of this speaks to, to me, um, whether it be through your agency or through the Department of Education, is that somehow we're not getting to those young people mm -hmm. um, who I suspect are the ones who are causing the majority of these crimes. Uh, and I, I'm trying to break through that, and I'm wondering how we can better work together with the DOE, with the Human Rights Commission, et cetera, to make that happen in a more effective way. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we would definitely be interested in, in, in talking through this more with you and with anybody else who's interested. Um, we, we do some, you know, we do have a peer mediation program. We do do work with schools, um, but I do think, uh, you know, I, I think, again, in talking about the difference, kind of the, the way that we can kind of come at certain problems with our law enforcement, but we can also come at other problems with our... Um, our community relations team. I think we're kind of uniquely situated to kind of offer this kind of alternative, kind of remedial approach for younger people who are experiencing this kind of, um, or having these experiences, uh, because I think that's probably a really good way to, to teach students, you know, through training and through kind of getting to know people and kind of events and, 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 and partnerships with the students. What about teachers and school administrators? Do you get any reports from them about discriminatory harassment between colleagues? For example, I don't. I'm not aware of whether we've received a report from a teacher, um, but it's certainly something that would be potentially covered under our law, right? Um, you know, discriminatory harassment between 
individuals who work together uh, could be a violation also under our, our employment discrimination, um, pr the provisions of our law if, you know, a supervisor is allowing discrimination to happen. So I think between colleagues, between individuals who are working together, uh, that would certainly, you know, if, if the – we would want to respond regardless, um, but it, it could also meet the threshold of discriminatory harassment. Um, and, you know, if the school fails to intervene, it can be a complaint as well if, if students are being bullied or, or – treated by either teachers or administrators or, or other students, there's a role for us potentially in those cases as well. And what about elected officials? Um, uh, I actually had to file a complaint with the Secretary of State against Senator Ruben Diaz Sr. Mm -hmm. um, because I was receiving emails after emails after emails uh, from him on uh, his stance on anti-marriage equality legislation that was um, that he was a, he was opposed to ma marriage equality in Albany. Uh, he may shortly be coming into the city council um, if he is elected. Um, but what are our rights as elected officials to be free from that type of um, harassment and discrimination? Um, Could I ask a question yeah. though? Is that um, from his mouth? Yeah. Those statements. Yeah. yeah. It's been that much that you feel. I, I filed a complaint with the Secretary of State, and eventually it stopped. But I'm, you know, he was, he was a state official at that time. But I'm wondering what our rights are here in the city council should that harassment continue here at the city council level. Yeah, I mean, I, I would be happy to talk to you or have our law enforcement folks talk to you more offline about it. Um, I, you know, always we have to look at the individual circumstances of a case um, to determine whether, you know, we are always, you know, considering. Let's just say in general, when elected and officials and espouse anti-gay hatred, how well, does I mean, the commission deal with that? I mean, the, uh, certainly, you know, I, I think there are ways beyond law enforcement to deal with kind of uh, government individuals who are engaging in this kind of conduct. I mean, it's, that, that's very problem. I mean, problematic is an understatement, right? So, like, that should not be happening. Uh, Can we at any really level. explain exactly uh, what we're saying? Because I don't want this hearing to be just stated as that. Because I, I read his stuff. Harassment to me is if he, specifically kept sending it to, to you directly like 50 times mm -hmm. or 20 times. But it's, it's been documented, Chair, in the Wall Street Journal. There's an article okay. on it. Okay. And then the state, the Secretary of State did intervene, and then it stopped. Okay, because we don't want to use this right. as a, a platform either for something else. But I know he's been strong on everyone, the mayor. I read his things from his mouth to your ears or whatever. And... He's been really relentless on a lot of people, so I don't want to just think that it, it was mm -hmm. just on you. So that's something else that we should think about, because if he's coming to city council, we may have to address it, but we can't stop people for their own freedom of speech just as well, because um, I'm thinking about um, someone, I think an Asian person hit someone and said, won't you go back to your country? Mm -hmm. Is that a claim? How can you put in a claim for that? I mean, it potentially. And then, I'm sorry, I'm mm -hmm. like. Yeah, I can, mean, someone can someone put force, in a claim? If someone uses force, right? That's force or threat of force. We, how um, can I say we come in through the door right now and someone have a hatred for someone else and they bump it? Well, or someone bump someone and then say, won't you go back to your country? Can you legally put in a claim for that. I would say that anyone who has an experience any along those lines should call us. Whether or not it will ultimately rise to the level of discriminatory harassment, and that sounds like it very much could, okay. um, would be a very okay. fact-specific inquiry. But we absolutely, I mean, again, that's, oh, I think, why our reports wait, are up so much. Wait. We wanted people, we want people to come to us, because even if it doesn't rise to the level Lisa's of law enforcement, there, it, well, it's documented, which, thank you for, for no, exactly. We need, like, to we, wanted, we need to be documenting this. But we also... We can respond in lots of different ways. So we've provided and it uh, stop training also. at city at city council before. Um, you know, cultural competency trainings. Mm -hmm. We've done um, at the at the request of city council. We've done trainings for lots of that. other mm -hmm. um, ASAP. state, city, federal agencies um, on some of the kind of materials of know your rights under our law. We've done a lot of those trainings. So there's lots of ways we can respond. Okay, I'm gonna yeah. turn it back over to Danny no, just Brown. To, but to before follow. I do, we have Matt, um, our council member Matthew Eugene. He has a youth here and he's chairing right now. Just want to let him know that he was here, and thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right. He has to get back to his hearing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. 
I turn it back over to Danny Drew. Sure, thank you. So just to follow up on that a little bit too, I had actually filed a complaint years, 25 years ago, against one of the school board uh, members that was harassing me and um, put into uh, writing um, uh, that he wanted me investigated because I was a pervert and because I was openly gay and I was uh, not afraid to mention to my students if they asked me that I was gay. Um, I would assume that today, I, I didn't win that case, but I would assume today that if um, individuals were to call gay people perverts, uh, would that rise to the level of discriminatory harassment? You know, I think that, you know, statements, expressions, declarations, we always have to be really careful about First Amendment violations. Um, or first, uh, you know, as a government agency, we have to be very careful about limiting people's First Amendment rights, and it's, it's a very fact-specific inquiry. So again, while um, but you, but you don't, I would so you want don't think someone, pervert would rise to that level? It, you know, again, it's, it's a fact-specific inquiry about whether or not using offensive language uh, is protected under the First Amendment or whether it rises to the level of But I notice in your testimony course. you do consider the faggot as discriminatory. I think it depends on whether or not it's coupled with conduct. It depends on the situation around how it happens. Uh, it's a very, like I said, it's, you know, it's about the subjective understanding and intent and experience of the person, um, uh, whether or not this has been someone who's been bullying them, whether it, it comes along with a threat, like a threatening language. But it's, it's something that we would have to look at the entire context. And we want people to bring you know, every experience that they have that they think could rise to that level because Again, even if it doesn't, even if it is protected under First Amendment, um, so even if somebody would use the N word, yeah, I mean, that's I, not discriminatory. You'd have to look at it in context. Well, d it could be discriminatory. It depends on the, the forum as well, right? So, like, if your boss is saying that to you, if you are walking into a restaurant and someone is calling you that uh, and making it clear that you are unwelcome there. Uh, because of who you are, uh, you know, it, again, it's very fact specific. So that may not be discriminatory harassment, but that may be a violation of the human rights law under, you know, discrimination, pro prohibitions on discrimination in public accommodations, employment, and housing. Um, so again, it, it really depends on the circumstances, uh, the, the subjective kind of intent and experience of the people, whether people feel threatened and in what way and whether that's reasonable. There's well, certainly, a, a very if you're a teacher analysis. and you have. Um somebody on the school board calling you that, it would rise to that level, I would think. It, it certainly could, but we would have to look at the facts of the case, yeah. Mm -hmm. Will it make the case stronger if um, someone else heard it or recorded it? it Can you do I, that? Yeah, well, I don't know. That's a good question. If it's in a public forum, which it was oftentimes. That's something to think about, because yeah. it's really someone's word against the other, so how can we in all contexts, I think proving discrimination under our law, if there are other people who've witnessed the incidents, that only helps in terms of kind of the evidence ultimately that might ne be needed at trial if that were to happen. Um, I, I want to take a step back and just kind of explain also that there's, you know, the discriminatory harassment is when people use, and, and there's no relationship, right? It could be people on the street that don't know each other. It could be neighbors, so they might know each other, but they don't have a, a separate relationship, right? If they use force or threat of force, right, and in doing so they injure someone, or they intimidate them, or they interfere with someone's protected rights, um, and it's based on that person, or even in part based on that person's protected status, that could be discriminatory harassment. First Amendment is always something we have to be very cautious of when the, when the conduct that someone, when, the, when, what is, when someone is talking about is purely speech, right? We have to be very careful about it and do a very fact-specific fact First an, uh, Amendment analysis. However, because we want people to come to us, no matter what they're experiencing, both to document what people's experiences are, also because we have all these other things we can do with our Community Relations Bureau, but also because you know, people may not realize that it was important that it was their landlord when they initially call. They may not realize that it mattered. They may just say somebody, so-and-so, they might use someone's name, but that could matter, right? Because the analysis could change, because our law also prohibits discrimination in employment, you're probably very familiar with this part, but employment, housing, and public accommodations, right? And it's it's oh, the the same protected categories. There's some slight variation, but for the most part, it's it's the same protected categories. And there's a different analysis there, right? Someone can't make you feel unwelcome when you come into their store because of who you are, and saying things to you that 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 make you feel unwelcome and un, and and that you can't be in that store. You know, even if it's verbal, it, it's a different analysis than it would be in the discriminatory harassment context. So that's why it's important, even if you know you're 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 giving me scenarios, right? But like, I'd need to know more. You know, where is it? What is the relationship? It, what kind of 
you know, what part of our law are we looking at? I, I would just urge the commission to look at that word in particular, the use of the word pervert. Um, uh, you know, uh, I think that's just as derogative as the, the word faggot or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, I have found that to be very offensive and um, yeah. definitely threatening. Yeah. And, and would really urge you to look at that. Sure, of course. Um, I think that's about it for now. Thank you. But I want to go back to um, the teach uh, in the Bronx, the harassment that just went on in the Bronx. I know y'all watch TV. You tell, do y'all have anyone that, like sometime I'm watching TV and I see something happen in my district and I have to call and start finding out what's going on. Mm -hmm. Your department does not do that with the schools? Uh, How know, are we coordinating? Some way or another, if we see a crisis, I think your department's supposed to, we shouldn't have to call. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't have to, it should already be a team ready to go to at least help our um, students. And Yes, please. May, may, Madam Chair, may I add to what you say? According to the, what the New, was reported in the New York Times, you know, uh, it says that the, um, the boy who um, stabbed the other boy, or the two, other two boys, uh, according to his friends, was different than the other boys in the school, you know, which to me is an indicator, uh, perhaps, of, you know, sexual orientation. Um, uh, so one has to wonder what type of emergency response do we have beyond just the Department of Education, and how would the Human Rights Commission intervene in, that, in those yeah. types of cases? Well, so that's exactly why we implemented the bias response team, right? Because we realized, again, people are not always calling us to make complaints. They're not always coming to us and telling us what's going on. We need to be there. We need to be on the ground. We need to be available. We need to have our ears kind of. Um, Can we get so you there? We, <laughs> Can we get you to the school? Well, I don't want to. I'm not sure about the specifics of this incident, um, so I don't want to comment on that specifically. But I would say that you know, of the bo of the reports that we've responded to since October, um, nine percent of them were came through us through social media. Uh, about eleven percent came through newspapers, uh, seeing things but in the newspapers. But so this is a big case. This is what we do. Yeah. And and to me, that should be one of your top priorities to go to because you could create a, a case on it, and it can help other schools from this case right. for the next. So you telling me now that you feel that you wouldn't go to that school. I, I can't understand why not. I, you know, th I, I don't That's know. That's what this yeah. mm -hmm. um, I department is really about. And some way or another, we have to get them to our schools more. Because mm -hmm. things are happening with bullyism and. Madam Chair, also, yes. I know that um, the council has legislation before it to also look at the segregated schools. And uh, that's something that's in this committee as well, and to ask the Human Rights Commission to intervene in the segregated school si situation. So um, that was really my thought in terms of the line of questioning here today, was that um, discriminatory harassment is very similar to bullying to me, and how do we use these, this agency to also address some of those issues that exist in our schools? Yeah, I, I think we would love, uh, love to explore um, you know, that with you and with anybody else. I, I think you're absolutely right. It's a really, it's a really important part of this. Um, I think um, you know, it's not just because complaints are made. It's because our comm team, our communications team monitors kind of what's going on and we respond. I mean, we generally don't comment on open investigations or if we are going out, you know, it, it would be We'd have to, internally, I think they'd have to, to look more into any specific scenario that you might bring to our attention, and I'm sure that they will do that. Um, but in terms of how we respond or whether we respond, I think, you know, I can't comment on that specifically. But in terms of just working with students, I think that is a goal of the commission as well. And we are, we now have a youth advisor um, at the office in our community relations bureau. We have, we are doing these peer mediation trainings with um, certain schools. We, we would love to find more ways to collaborate on, on helping our students, you know, uh, respond and deal with discriminatory harassment and make sure that people are accountable for making sure that these students are safe. Um, so what are the two new um, staff that you just received in your department? Um, we, uh, the, the, we are right now hiring a, um, we're right now hiring uh, two discriminatory harassment investigators. Um, and those are posted right now. Um, and uh, Posted if anyone want a yeah. job. Yeah. Um, and so we. You gotta be serious about this, because it's like this committee, 
This hearing is so quiet and so nice. We should be mad as hell and not going to take it anymore. So it's just so nice and we should really be mad. So I hope someone out there is a real true advocate. Start telling a friend. Apply for those jobs that we can really have some true advocacy out here that can go beyond just the norm. That's what we need. What other? What are the jobs? Um, I, I'm and I have oh, one so more question. So from the two of them were the discriminatory harassment um, investigators. One was Jewish. And then we recently hired two um, like lead advisors. So Widat Hassan, who is here, um, is our lead advisor on Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities. Um, and she was recently at the Muslim Community Network. That was a, a position that formerly was, was uh, with Rama Issa, who is now at the Arab American Association of New York. Um, and then a liaison to Jewish communities. Um, you know, both of those communities are communities that in, in the bias response, um, in our, in our uh, the bias incidents that we have seen, um, the majority of them have been, or many of them have been based on religion. Um, and, and, and within that, uh, Category: Muslim and Jewish, um, anti-Muslim, anti-Jewish. Um, so, you know, we also hired a uh, um, Beth Miller, who's also here, um, okay. who will be serving as our uh, liaison to Jewish communities as well. Okay, I have one last question for you. What are some of the challenges CCHR has identified in implementing the discriminatory harassment provision? What are the challenges you said? Yes. Well, I mean, I think it's it's a law that's been on the books since '91 amended in 93, and there's no guidance, there's no case law. It doesn't seem like cases were brought to the commission or the commission enforced this provision of the law. It doesn't seem like people brought these claims um, in state court. So there's very little guidance as to how to interpret it, what it means, how to prepare for these kinds of cases. So I think we have really relied on our listening sessions and our relationships with the community to help guide our response to these kinds of violations. You know, law enforcement, we have we have that one mechanism and that response, but we also have all these other ways. And I think a challenge has been to kind of figure out what's the best way to get people to come to us and report and let us know um, what's going on. Um, and obviously, we've seen a, a huge uptick in people coming to us. So I hope that means that we are instilling confidence in, 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 in at least some of these communities that we are here and we're, we're here to help. Um, so I think there is some indication of that. Um, okay. But it, that is a challenge to have communities come forward to talk to us about these incidents. Okay, I want to commend you and the commissioner on that. I think you have um, suffice with going to the religious institutions. The, um, but one thing I think you should start doing the mobile clinics at yeah. the schools. Because uh -huh. to me, it's still, it's almost bullying and harassment. Yeah. And a lot of people will not speak up if no one is there. It's almost like if you build it, they'll come. Yeah. But now... If you there in front of the school, yeah. they may just come in and tell you a whole lot yeah. what is going on. Because we can't be everywhere. And the mm -hmm. teachers can't be there. And the security cannot be there. When a, a child go into the bathroom, you don't know what kind of harassment and discriminatory things are being said to our young people in the bathroom that they may not say to anyone unless if they see a, a mobile van there, clinic, they could, they could just come in and say, guess what this guy said to me, that he may do this to me later. or And then you could document it. We have to have some kind of way that you connect. You're doing good with all the churches and everything, but now we have to think about our schools because a lot of it starts yeah. right there. We, you know, just to highlight one additional thing that I, I think and would I'm be interesting yeah. um, for you guys is the the Unity Project, um, which was, it's a hear you. What the Unity Project. And Unity the with the, the First Lady yeah. Shirlane yes. McCray. Yes. She made me say it right Saturday. <laughs> I said um, it somewhere, Shirlane. That's McCray. a multi-agency kind of um, initiative to provide support for LGBTQ youth. Um, and so I hope, you know, that will probably involve kind of working with schools, working with the youth. And I think, you know, we would love your input on, on thinking about strategies and, and how to work with those students. Um, and it's a really, I think it's a very exciting project that's happening. Well, just to kind of wrap it up, you know, I, I, I honestly believe that metal detectors cannot prevent bigotry. Mm -hmm. And um, I think education can. And so uh, that's where I think the Human Rights Commission comes in. And I really like your idea of putting a, a van or getting somebody up to that school and to other schools that are not being serviced where students don't know their rights. And, and thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me the time. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Chief of Staff, <laughs> Ms. Erling. No, no, what's her name? Lorraine Elfar. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for representing the commission. Um, at this time, we have no, you have any further questions? No, I'm good. So thank you so much thank you. for your input. We're going to have now our advocates come up and speak. Albert Kahn, Karen, and Margaret LaFord, Urban Justice Center. Care New York, Council of American Islamic Correlation. Relation. Relation. Relation, Relation, New York. Ah, you look, it's look like a doctor. No. <laughs> Thank you. You have time. You're the only um, advocate group that is here. So we will finish up with you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you know, we're very happy to be here this afternoon to take the time to support the commission and the extraordinary work they've been doing to work on behalf of the Muslim community in what has been a truly I'm sorry, could you state your, you yeah. have to state it on the record Oh, yourself. yes, yes. Uh, my name is Albert Fox Khan. I'm the legal director of CARE New York, the Council on American Islamic Relations of New York. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you, Chair Mealy. Thank you, Council Member Drum. You know, the numbers are quite staggering. In 2016 and 2017, Muslim Americans witnessed a 65% increase in bias incidents and more than a 580% increase in anti-Muslim hate crimes. But the numbers were even worse here in New York. In 2016 alone, we saw a 560% increase in anti-Muslim harassment, discrimination, and hate crimes. And these are heartbreaking cases that have affected Muslim New Yorkers of every age, of every ethnicity, of every language pre preference, rich and poor, people who have been attacked in broad daylight, murdered in some cases, simply for going about their lives and trying to practice their faith. You know, we also witness an unprecedented climate at the national level with a president who enables a climate of hate, who legitimizes anti-Muslim sentiment. And the numbers show the impact. Of our 2016 hate crimes... Can we put a claim against them? Well, it's always a difficult... A claim under New York law against the president? Is is almost inciting sometimes riots or dis discriminatory um, words being said to one another all of a sudden now. So maybe if this keeps going on, we well, have to think about some. Under the Supreme Court's Brandenburg holding, which set forth a three-pronged test for incitement and for when it can be punished, there is actually a very high bar where you have to explicitly call for unlawful action. It has to be imminent, and it has to actually occur. The fact is here we see people committing hate crimes at higher rates. We see them sometimes even invoking the president's own words in the course of the crime. But still, it's too attenuated to then go and prosecute or even sue him for the climate he's created. But the numbers show that there is a tremendous shift because in 2016, when we saw this surge in hate crimes, more than half of them came in just the last seven and a half weeks of the year, immediately following the election. Less than two months accounting for more than half of the year's crimes. We are ev on a pace to see even higher levels of crimes and harassment and discrimination in 2017. Our preliminary do data shows that we are continuing to see increases as measured on a month-to-month -month average. We don't have precise data on the increase rate for discriminatory harassment. We had a change in our data collection methodology, but combined with the other trends we've observed combined and the anecdotes we've documented, there is strong evidence to support there has been a significant increase in the rates of discriminatory harassment, particularly within the Muslim community. 
Throughout this time, the City Commission on Human Rights has been a leading supporter of Muslim New Yorkers. They have partnered with us at CARE New York for a variety of projects, including the I Am Muslim NYC Solidarity Campaign and the forthcoming Muslim Community Survey. Since President Trump's first executive order banning immigration from Muslim-majority countries, the Muslim ban, they have stood side by side with us at CARE New York and other community-based organizations to say they would defend the rights of Muslim New Yorkers, that they would be protected under the laws of this city, and that the commission would do all in its power to make sure that this remains a city of immigrants and this remains a city where all can practice their faith. Unfortunately, it's an uphill fight because of the rhetoric and policies we see coming out of this White House. Policies like the Muslim ban and the repeal of DACA have driven countless New Yorkers into the shadows. They're terrified and often unwilling to report the crimes that they have suffered, even though that is their right. But we continue to work with the commission to help these most vulnerable subsets of the community to come forward and to vindicate their rights. But we, none of this is happening in a vacuum, and the Muslim, the Muslim community here in New York is all too aware of the NYPD's history here, the history of discriminatory and unlawful surveillance, of their continued information sharing with federal law enforcement, of their continued work in fusion centers, which allow these agencies to readily interact. Yes, our city has Executive Order 41. Yes, it has a sanctuary city status. But that is not enough to provide assurance to the communities we serve, especially not at a time when ICE continues its unlawful practice of arresting victims and witnesses to crimes in our very courthouses. These policies create a systemic barrier to the effective use of discriminatory harassment laws that must be addressed through additional reforms of the NYPD surveillance practices. Particularly, we at CARE New York believe the POST Act would be a vital tool to ensure that the NYPD surveillance practices are, can, are less of a barrier to the effective reporting of crime. This act would allow us to better understand the tools being used to surveil the Muslim community and the way the, that information is being shared with other stakeholders, including the federal government. You know, we're hopeful that the passage of that act and with other reforms of the NYPD, we can, can only improve our work with the commission to help Muslim New Yorkers assert claims of discriminatory harassment and to report any hate crimes impacting the community. Thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to working with uh, the council as well in the coming months to address this issue. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Margaret Lyford, and I'm a paralegal at the Community Development Project of the Urban Justice Center. Um, we're here to share how several recent trends, including, including the rise in predatory equity and the xenophobic rhetoric coming out of Washington, are further emboldening landlords to harass the most politically and economically marginalized New York, New York tenants. The increase in predatory equity incentivizes over-leverage over landlords to prey on tenants in gentrifying neighborhoods while providing generous returns to their investors. Yet this profit depends on the tenants in place in gentrifying neighborhoods, usually people of color and immigrants, leaving. To drive long-term tenants of color out and attract higher paying, usually white newcomers, we see landlords who provide better services to white tenants than to tenants of color. For example, one Brooklyn landlord gave space heaters only to white tenants while refusing to provide central heat for the entire building. In other cases, we have seen landlords give their personal phone numbers to white tenants for submitting repair requests while leaving tenants of color to call useless, automated answering services. Some landlords deliberately increase tensions between white tenants and tenants of color. One Brooklyn management company tells tenants to call 911 to make noise complaints and advises against tenants confronting another directly because it is dangerous. After using this racially coded language, the landlord then uses these 911 calls as a basis for nuisance hold holdovers against the tenants of color. 
Landlords also used complaints and threats of complaints to law enforcement agencies to severely antagonize tenants of color. Landlords called the police or ACS, falsely accusing tenants of color of drug dealing or child neglect. These harassment tactics often leave tenants of color so desperate that some make the agonizing decision to leave their home. When they do, the landlord can significantly increase the rent for the next tenant and their investment grows in value. Furthermore, President Trump's xenophobic rhetoric emboldens, land emboldens landlords looking to push out immigrant tenants. One landlord in Sunset Park posted notices in all of his buildings advising tenants to cooperate with ICE officers when they knock on your door. A landlord in Morningside Heights brought an eviction case against an undocumented tenant using her immigration status as a basis for the case. In Trump's America, the stakes are high for immigrants, and our clients frequently report to us that their undocumented neighbors suffer the worst conditions but hesitate to participate in tenant meetings, action, and litigation for fear of retaliation. The Community Development Project applauds the community's attention to the intersection of discrimination and tenant harassment. Too often, policymakers diagnose tenant harassment as solely an economic issue, while only lip service is paid in passing to the fact that usually tenants of color and immigrants who are di being displaced in favor of white tenants often use long-standing tools of racial oppression, over-policing, over-punishing, and selective denial of services. To combat discriminatory harass harassment, the city must continue to strengthen its response to tenant harassment in general while also addressing the failure that makes tenants of color and immigrants the most vulnerable. To co combat these emerging threats, uh, the Community Development Project's housing team has partnered with our immigration attorney colleagues to offer Know Your Rights trainings at tenant meetings. This approach has made undocumented tenants feel more comfortable and willing to participate in group litigation against their landlord. CDP also coordinates Stabilizing NYC, a citywide coalition that organizes against the excesses of predatory equity landlords. Yet much remains to be done. We ask that you continue to vigorously advocate on behalf of your constituents with city agencies when tenants call to report harassment or dangerous conditions. Some of our clients have given up after calling 311 dozens of times without a response or having had their complaints routed to the wrong agencies. As you know, your position as conduits and advocates between your constituents and city agencies often makes a difference between a complaint lost in the system or lost in translation and a meaningful response that shows landlords that you're paying attention and that will, New York will not tolerate discrimination and harassment. We would also like to take this opportunity to thank the City Council for providing funding to Stabilizing NYC. Stabilizing NYC is a coalition of neighborhood-based groups and legal service providers that seek to combat predatory equity and preserve rent stabilized units through community organizing and advocacy. We ask you continue to support Stabilizing NYC as its focus on community organizing is an especially important tool for immigrants and tenants of color because it allows for tenants to take action as a group, making individuals less susceptible to being singled out for retaliation by their landlord. Should I stop? Okay. Um, strong community organizing, while always important, stands to become even more crucial with the rollout to the right to counsel for tenants in housing court. We recognize and applaud the historic passage of the right to counsel for tenants, but we anticipate that landlords, knowing that tenants will be represented, will decrease their reliance on eviction cases and instead turn to harassment to force tenants out. Because of this dynamic, we ask that you continue to fund the anti-harassment tenant protection program. This funding allows us, along with several other legal service providers, to bring affirmative litigation against landlords who deny tenant services, repairs, and engage in other forms of harassing behavior. Critically, HTP provides tenants and organizers with another tool to employ as they advocate for safer, more affordable housing. Finally, New York City now more than ever has a duty to build trust with immigrant communities. Immigrants should feel safe making complaints when their landlords remove their bathrooms, refuse to give their children keys, and overcharge them for rent. While the city cannot control federal immigration policy, it can discourage landlords from taking advantage of these policies by vigorously defending and enforcing the rights of immigrant tenants. We know from our daily work that many immigrants either do not know or do not trust that they can contact city agencies without repercussions. 
While this is certainly not news to the members of the committee, the fight against anti-immigrant discrimination can only be as strong as the city's commitment to being truly, to truly being a sanctuary city where immigrants know that the government is there for them and not against them. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today. Wow, thank you. Um, I'm glad you brought that out. Um, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. It's so much, and I got to thank uh, one of my our colleagues, Jamani Williams, put in uh, some legislation in regards to when the landlord try to make you get out or give you $5,000 to get out of your rent-stabilized apartment. And now they have to give you a mark, a good market rate, or not just ten thousand. Five thousand dollars will not get anyone anywhere. Right. Y'all know that if you got to move. So I would say fifty thousand, twenty-five thousand. Okay, but other than that, um, I think we have to start pressing on the landlords more. Um, this is not something that we don't know about right now. It's going on rapidly, and it seemed like we behind the eight ball, because it's happening. And before we knew it, know it, by next year, the whole Brooklyn or the whole city have changed already. And people who have went through the bad times in our neighborhoods, and now that all of a sudden housing is now, uh, no, Brooklyn, let's just keep it real, sorry. You're from Queens, right? <laughs> Brooklyn is the new Manhattan. Everyone is coming back to Brooklyn, and people are being thrown out of their apartment. Gentrification is um, just rampant right now. I just pray that your organization continues staying strong. I will definitely continue referring people to you just as well. But if we don't press on the landlords, and sometime we have to think about um, the police department also. Um, I just had one through my office. People was in their apartment just because they was paying, the, the landlord wanted them uh, not to pay the rent. He wasn't going to accept their rent. But before you get someone out, you got to take them to court. Right. He had threw them out, and the police officer told the landlord, I will arrest you if you don't let these people back in. But the next day, the landlord came with another police officer and kicked them out and arrested them. Wow. So I'm gonna give you that case, because something has to be done, and this is documented. They arrested these people, something is wrong. Yes. And if one officer say, no, it's illegal, you have to go through the proper channels, that's the court system, and the next one say, maybe he's a friend with the landlord. Not saying all police officers are that, but something went wrong there. Yes. So I thank you. Would you have any questions? No question, but just a, a word of thanks yeah. to CARE and to Urban Justice Care. as well for the work that you've done. Uh, I have carried a sign early on in my tenure as a uh, council member on, on I Am Muslim Too Day uh. and proud to have done that and, and, and very aware of the work that you're doing as well as with the Urban Justice Center. And I'm really glad that you highlighted the issue of uh, tenant harassment yeah. because, you know, in Corona, which is just over... Uh, the boundaries of my district, about a block away, we had a landlord who was uh, threatening people because of their immigration status and threatening to expose their immigration status uh, to harass them and get them out of the building. So this is a real and an important issue, uh, one that we need to continue to draw attention to and to continue to fight back against. And, and I think a lot of this is happening, as the chair has mentioned, because of the current administration in Washington, D.C. So uh, we, I stand united with you in resistance to uh, the President Trump, and I look forward to continuing to fight with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I thank you, Care, also. Continue keeping up the fight. But I feel um, we should be mad as hell right now. And and I think one thing I'm going to shut up, I don't know if I'm going to get myself in trouble, but if someone could stand on a, a podium and say, we need to punch somebody in the face, and someone get punched in the face, something is wrong. That's harassment, that's intimidation, that someone initiated and it was carried out. And that happened at one of the conventions. We all know that. Oh, and, and just to clarify my earlier remark, that example actually um, is the closest to any of the cases I'm aware of that could be subject to prosecution. Regrettably, to the best of my knowledge, there's never been an incident in New York City where we would have jurisdiction to, to prosecute where it's uh, where he had an equally direct 
call to action followed immediately by violence. And that really is what's required to prosecute for a hate crime and to a lesser extent what's necessary for discriminatory harassment. Okay, and I thank everyone for showing up and, and keep the fight going. And thank you, Kid. Thank you, Justice System. And this civil rights hearing is now adjourned.